Kenny Lofton belongs in the Hall of Fame. It's a sentiment myself and many other baseball fans share, from those who watched him play every day in the 1990s to those who only see his talents through old video highlights like myself. But I also don't believe it's far-fetched to say that Lofton is the best leadoff hitter of a generation even if you didn't get to watch him every day. His talents are rivaled only by the great Ricky Henderson who's in the Hall of Fame, and you'll hear a lot more of that name in this video. We're gonna dive into a ton of numbers, splits, singular games, and stories in this video, but it will stem from the notion that the story of baseball, specifically the story of the steroid era, cannot be told without the presence of Kenny Lofton. Baseball players aren't really made like him anymore, and the mark of his influence left on baseball alone should be enough to validate his Cooperstown case. But for some reason, he's still not a part of that group. So let's figure out why. But if you guys enjoyed today's video, make sure you subscribe to the channel and leave a like on the video. Also, ring the bell for all future notifications so you don't miss a Jolly Olive upload. Kenny Lofton was always a touted athlete. He attended University of Arizona on a basketball school scholarship and helped the Wildcats make the Final Four in 1988. Hell, he didn't even join the school's baseball team until his third year there. Inexplicably, after using their first round pick on him, the Houston Astros traded him after his first big league season. Thus, Kenny Lofton and Cleveland became a pair, a synonymous pair. After a couple of losing seasons, Cleveland had assembled a dominant core of potent hitters by 1994. Their murderer's row featured the likes of a young Manny Ramirez, future Hall of Fame slugger Jim Tomei, perennial MVP candidate Albert Bell, and veteran hit king Eddie Murray. But in this batch of bona fide talents, the key ingredient was always the man at the top of the order, Kenny Lofton. A whole lot of two-run and three-run home runs would have turned into solo shots if not for Kenny finding his way on base to kickstart a rally. It's what enabled him to score 100 runs or more in six of his first nine full seasons. While the Sluggers provided the big game-shifting hits night in and night out, it was Kenny Lofton that was the beating heart of a franchise undergoing transformation. I could tell you a bunch of numbers and splits right out the gate, but instead, why don't we just take a look at his weaponry in action? Let's kick things forward to a September matchup with the Orioles in 2000, Kenny Lofton's 10th season in the league. Despite being 33 years old at this time, he still was as talented as he was the decade prior. Lofton kicks off the day with a single, then steals second base and eventually advances advances again on a flyout. Jim Tomei's single would bring him home for the first run of the day, and just like that, Lofton had manufactured a first inning run. Later in the third inning, he singles again. He steals second base again, and then ups the ante by stealing third base this time as well, and by the third inning, he already has three stolen bases. An errant pickoff throw scores him for the second time, and Cleveland ties the game at two runs apiece. He comes up again in the fourth inning, and this time, he bunts his way on for good measure. It's his third hit of the game. Of course, he naturally steals second base for his fourth stolen base, and Omar Vizquel's single brings him home for his third run scored. It's the fourth inning and he's already completely filled up the stat sheet. The Orioles finally got Kenny Lofton out in his next three at-bats as the game pushed into extra innings tied at 11 runs apiece. But to cap things off in the 13th inning, Kenny Lofton turned up his flair for the dramatic with this walk-off solo home run. Yeah, he can slug the ball too. He finishes the day with four hits, four runs scored, five stolen bases, a walk, and a walk-off home run. This was Kenny Lofton at the peak of his abilities, but this is the kind of things he could bring to a game day in and day out. Pedro Martinez, one of the most dominant pitchers of Lofton's era and just baseball in general, named Lofton as among the most difficult hitters to pitch against in his career, and that's not even factoring the terror he would reign on the base paths once he got on. Before we jump too far ahead in the 2000s, let's kick things back to 1994, Lofton's first all-star year and the true first year of his prime as a baseball player. His fourth highest single season stolen base total was 60 stolen bases in this aforementioned 1994 year, a season where he led all position players in hits and wins above replacement. He also made the All-Star team and won a gold glove. Did I mention that he managed all of this in a strike-shortened season at 118 games total? The 60 stolen bases he racked up here could have actually been closer to 80, which would have been a career high. Perhaps if the strike never occurs and Lofton plays a full season, his torrid pace continues and he places higher than fourth on MVP balloting. Imagine Kenny Lofton the speedster winning an MVP in the era of power hitters. Lofton was a victim of timing in more ways than one throughout his career. Not just this strike-shortened season, but the era he played in in general. Kenny hit for average, had great plate discipline, could definitely slug the ball, and obviously was one of the fastest players to ever step foot on a baseball field. The only man arguably faster was obviously Ricky Henderson. Only two players since the beginning of the expansion era have had three separate seasons where they hit 300 or higher, stole 60 bases or more, and scored 100 runs or more. I'm pretty sure you can guess who the two are. But as we know, Ricky and Kenny aren't held in the same regard. A year after the strike in 1995, Cleveland won 100 games in another shortened year, and their playoff 
playoff run led us to one of Kenny's best moments in his illustrious career. In Game 6 of the 1995 American League Championship Series, the miracle Seattle Mariners had their backs up against the wall, down a run in the top of the eighth facing elimination. Still within striking distance, Randy Johnson looked to shut down the top of Cleveland's order. The thing is, Kenny Lofton was in his way. Kenny Lofton bunted his way on to shift a runner to third and get himself a single. A stolen base by Lofton put two ducks in scoring position. Then, a pass ball that traveled deep enough to score not one run, but two, thanks to Lofton's speed at second base. Soon after, a Carlos Baerga home run made it 4 to nothing, which would be the final as the Indians advanced to the Fall Classic. It's not quantifiable, but it certainly seemed like Lofton's clutch hitting and clutch speed demoralized the Mariners and secured a key victory for Cleveland. Either way, it was a vital insurance run that got them to the World Series. The Indians didn't get the job done that year, but were also in the midst of the greatest stretch of Lofton's dominant playing days. One of Lofton's best seasons came the year after in 1996, where he achieved career highs in runs scored, hits, doubles, and stolen bases. Only three players since the expansion era began have achieved a season with over 200 hits and 75 stolen bases or more, and this is a list that Ricky Henderson somehow is not on. Lofton is the most recent to do it back in 1996, joined by Willie Wilson in 1980 and Maury Willis in 1962. There were no real peaks and valleys for Lofton's skill set and talents. He was remarkably consistent during the first half of his career. Kenny Lofton is one of just eight players in Major League history to accomplish four seasons or more with 25 stolen bases and an on-base percentage over 400, joining an illustrious list featuring Barry Bonds, Bobby Abreu, and Craig Biggio. From 1992 to 2001, an extended length of his prime, Kenny Lofton had the third highest wins above replacement among all outfielders at 52.8 wins, trailing only Ken Griffey Jr. and Barry Bonds. He ranked ahead of the likes of his then-teammate Manny Ramirez, as well as Sammy Sosa, Larry Walker, and Andrew Jones, slashing a 303 batting average with a 428 slugging and a 111 OPS+. I mentioned consistency before, specifically in the first half of his career, but even in his later years where he was the gold standard of a baseball journey man, he managed a 293 cumulative batting average, 24 stolen bases a season, and 21 doubles a season. Like I said, consistent. He managed this playing for the White Sox, Giants, Pirates, Cubs, Yankees, Phillies, Dodgers, Rangers, and then Indians again to cap it all off, all in a six-year span from 2002 to 2007. Even at age 40 in his final season in 2007, Kenny Lofton still swiped 23 bases. Again, remarkably similar to Ricky Henderson, who bounced around 10 different teams in the final decade of his 25-year career. And if you didn't notice already, Kenny Lofton was a necessary weapon to a team trying to win a World Series. He appeared in the postseason in five of those six years during his prime with Cleveland and Atlanta, but even in his nomad days that came after, he was still a key piece of every playoff run he was on. In 2002, the Giants traded for him and started him in center field for each of their 17 playoff games. In 2003, the Chicago Cubs traded for him where a seventh inning meltdown prevented him from starting in center field in consecutive World Series at age 35 and 36. Look up playoff highlights anywhere from 1995 to 2007, and chances are you can probably find Lofton's face pretty easily. But despite his frequent trips to October play, Lofton experienced a ton of playoff heartbreak in his remarkable career. His 1995 squad fell short to the Atlanta Braves in the World Series, a matchup that Lofton still contests was tilted in Atlanta's favor due to dodgy umpiring. Later on, he was eight outs away from a ring with the Giants in 2002 before he ended up making the last out in what became an all-time collapse. In 2003, he was leading off every postseason game for the Cubs, who had their fate sealed by Steve Bartman. In 2004, he was a part of the Yankees team that became the first ever to blow a 3-0 series lead in baseball history. In 2007, his last hurrah, he put together arguably his best playoff performance. Lofton hit 279 with three doubles, a home run, two stolen bases, and six runs batted in. And with those two stolen bases, broke the all-time postseason record for career playoff stolen bases at 34, passing up Ricky Henderson in the process. But his final pursuit fell short in a Game 7 ALCS loss to the Red Sox. Perhaps if Cleveland comes out on top here, they too cruise to a World Series title over the Rockies like Boston did. Instead, this was the final chapter that closed Lofton's impressive career. At the end of his playing days, he placed himself 15th all-time on the stolen base leaderboard with an absurd total of 622 swipes. He jumps to 8th all-time if you include players from the expansion era only. His defensive prowess landed him 16th all-time in outfield assists 
His 68.4 career wins above replacement is tied for 77th all-time with Carlton Fisk and Edgar Martinez, two Hall of Famers. In fact, his ranking there places him in a sea of men who got their special nod to the Hall. I think it's time we figure out why exactly Kenny Lofton isn't a part of the Hall of Fame. Despite all of his accomplishments, the fact that I mentioned at the top of the video remains true. Kenny Lofton is one of the most egregious Cooperstown snubs of a generation. It stems from a trio of reasons we'll dive into, a lack of tangible playoff success, an absence of serious power hitting numbers, and a poor relationship with the media developed over two decades. Lofton often got overshadowed in both his playing days and after them being a part of the most prevalent steroid era in baseball history. His skill set of speed, contact, and defense, while exciting, was not what was selling during the 1990s. While he routinely posted an OPS over 800 during his prime, it wasn't the video game numbers that his contemporaries and teammates were posting at the time. But a stat that always loved Lofton's skills is wins above replacement. The threshold for fringe Hall of Fame players usually hovers around 60 wins above replacement, and Lofton surges above that with his career 68.3 B-War. He ranks as the 10th most valuable center fielder in baseball history, ahead of Hall of Famers like Duke Snyder, Andre Dawson, Kirby Puckett, and Richie Ashburn. This war value also places him on par with Hall of Fame position players like his teammate Eddie Murray, as well as Pudge Rodriguez and Tony Gwynn. But outside of the numbers and the things he accomplished, it also bears mentioning that the 2013 ballot was one of the most controversial voting years in the Hall of Fame's history. First, you had legendary shoe-in players still sitting on the ballot waiting for their nod. The bigger notion here is the known or accused steroid users, many of whom entering the ballot for the first time in their career. Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, Sammy Sosa, generation-defining legends of the game, all mired in complications. Voters were rightfully split on these names, but again, this caused votes to flutter about and pile up more so on the debatable and controversial players. This combination of factors made it all too easy for Lofton's name to get overlooked. Lofton was on the ballot with nine players who have been elected in the years since. Craig Biggio, Jack Morris, Mike Piazza, Jeff Bagwell, Tim Raines, Lee Smith, Edgar Martinez, Alan Trammell, and Larry Walker. Maybe if Lofton hits the ballot right now, things are completely different. Maybe the Eras Committee can still save his chances like they did for Fred McGriff, but Lofton rightfully didn't hold back any quotes when reacting to garnering just 3.4% of votes in his first year on the ballot, a low enough percentage to knock him off completely. Lofton was quoted saying, I just felt like they were concentrating on cheaters instead of concentrating on players who were legitimate. I just feel that I personally got affected by other guys cheating. Lofton's first year on the ballot was the first time in seven 17 years that the Writers Association didn't elect a player to the Hall of Fame. The book isn't closed here like I mentioned before, but Kenny Lofton certainly deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, and only time will tell if he ever gets in. But if he doesn't, I hope this video can stand as a testament to just how good he was both during his prime and in the later years where he was bouncing around to every playoff team. But that'll do it for this video, and now a word from today's sponsor. Today's Jolly Isle video was brought to you by the DraftKings Sportsbook. Right now, new customers can bet just $5 on any pregame Moneyline bet and instantly get $150 dollars in bonus bets and they can spread that money on some same game parlays for a shot at even bigger winnings at the end of the day whether you're betting on basketball playoffs or the current baseball season there's tons of fun things to do on the DraftKings Sportsbook and it's a free and easy to use app you can download it right now use promo code olive o-l-i-v-e and take advantage of this offer bet five dollars on any pregame money line bet and get 150 dollars in bonus bets instantly only at the DraftKings Sportsbook minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply see show notes for details and any resources you might need for a gambling problem or addiction are listed down below as always. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video and I'll see you guys next time.